So rather than these companies outgrowing these type of developer-friendly payment APIs and then having to build their own army of engineers, which is what Lyft did, they can now come to Phoenix and we can provide them all the payment APIs uh, and infrastructure to stand up their payment business. I basically dumped my LinkedIn from the folks that I knew and just reached out to people and said, hey, I'm starting my own company. Do you know people who in the industry you know, who could help? Alrighty, hello everyone and welcome to the Deal Maker Show. So super excited about the guests that we have today. We're gonna be talking about scaling, financing, I mean building, growing, I mean you name it. Uh, and I find that his story too of going from corporate to uh, startups is super remarkable. I mean, from humble beginnings to now really, you know, having been able to build something for himself from the ground up, I think that we're all gonna enjoy very much this story. So I guess Without further ado, let's welcome our guest today, Richie Serna. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. So originally, you were born to um, immigrant parents, you know, parents that came from Mexico uh, here to the U.S. to look for a better future for themselves, for their family. I'm sure that that has been quite inspiring for you and, and obviously not, not very easy for them at the beginning when they had to move here to the country, you know? Yeah. I mean, my parents' story is absolutely foundational to, to who I am, um, to my work ethic, to the way that I approach life. Uh, one of the things that I always start every single interview whenever I bring on a new candidate is I ask them, what's your story and how did that shape you in your life? And for me, it was definitely my parents um, coming to the States. So my mom uh, immigrated here in the 60s, my dad in the 70s, and they met here in uh, Santa Ana. Um, and so it's a part of Southern California in Orange County. Uh, very different, though, from the the OC that you see on MTV and these other TV shows. Uh, this is definitely the real OC is where I'm from. So it's 80% uh, Mexican immigrants. My I think I have something like 40, 50 first cousins that still live there. Um, but you know, my parents were tirelessly, you know, hardworking um, um, immigrants who came here to really provide a better upbringing for myself and for my brother. My dad's a bus driver uh, for OCTA, the Orange County Transportation Association. Uh, he actually just won. Uh, employee of the month last month. So across all the bus drivers in all of Orange County, he or employee of the year, excuse me. So I think that's exactly where I get my work ethic and my hustle is from him. That's amazing. And and your mother, you know, very early on, she knew that she wanted to provide the absolute best future that 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 they could really for you. And she fought hard to make sure that you had access to the best education. So so what did she do? Yeah, I mean, my mom is a fighter. First and foremost, uh, she actually dropped out of, of school at a young age so she could raise her five sisters. And I think that's just always who she's been. You know, she fights for the people that she loves uh, and she fights to give people um, a better chance, uh, a better chance than she had. And so uh, when I got into uh, elementary school in the city that I come from in Santa Ana, they're some of the worst actually schools in the state. And so most of them are actually taken over by the, the, the sort of federal government. Uh, and so to get into the better schools, which are still not as good as the, you know, some of the best public schools in the state. Uh, she actually had a camp outside the school. And this is an elementary school. She camped out there to make sure that I could get the best lottery possible. Uh, then in high school, when our schools in Santa Ana um, didn't have better opportunities, she went to Irvine, which was like the neighboring uh, uh, school district. And they are, I think, the second safest city in all of America. Uh, it's probably, I think it's like the best suburb to ever live in. And they have some of the best public education. She literally took my test scores to every single uh, principal walked in and just said, you know, will you take my school? No after no after no until finally someone said yes. It's the same thing with pitching, right? You just got to get to that first yes. And my mom had that same mentality. That's amazing. Uh, I mean, obviously that, that was the segue for, you know, really getting for the first time into an airplane that would land you into the campus of, of Harvard. I mean, yeah. talking about like what an incredible transformation. I mean, I'm sure that you know, when, when, when that was being the case, you know, probably your, your parents, you know, had tears of joy. So tell us. About uh, my mom story. didn't believe me. <laughs> so my mom didn't, when I got into Harvard, I remember, uh, I, I, uh, I remember I went home and, uh, you know, they sent me an email. And so usually they send you like these big packets and stuff like that. So I was like, oh, if they send you an email, that's the rejection notification, right? They don't even, they're not even going to put that on paper. So I opened up the email and it's like, congratulations, you got in. And I just sat there by myself, like in a dark room, completely quiet. I was like, this can't be real. I read it like five different times. Uh, and then I called my mom and I was like, mom, you're not going to believe this. And she's like, what? And uh, <laughs> I was like, I got into Harvard. 
And she goes, shut up. No, you didn't. And then so, <laughs> so we all read it together and, you know, absolutely tears of joy that, that, that came across. Uh, my, my grandma, uh, who doesn't speak much English and, and, and doesn't necessarily know, didn't know at the time what Harvard was, was she was like, why don't you just go to Santa Ana Community College? It's right across the street. <laughs> and I was like, it's a little, it's a little different, grandma. Uh, and so I ended up flying out there and, and um, for, you know, students who couldn't afford, they actually paid for you to fly out there so you could attend. Uh, and see like the pre-frost weekend. And I remember it was like a scene out of a movie where like my hands were like this against the taxi window, seeing the beautiful like brickstone architecture of Boston and just being completely in awe of, you know, the architecture, the culture, everything that was there. And, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily like the awesome welcoming experience when you go on the pre-frost campus. You're like, oh, everybody there seems like they're working insanely hard and aren't that happy. And for me, it was like, if I can make it here, I can make it anywhere. And so I knew that that was going to be a place that pushed me to move across the country, to not have family out there. And it was honestly one of the best experiences of my life. And, you know, it's very interesting because after Harvard, basically, I mean, you did you did a, a couple of, uh, of internships. One that you did, mm -hmm. that was, uh, you know, you did investment banking, then you went into consulting. But it's very interesting because some of the best founders that I interview, they've either been investment bankers or they have been consultants. I mean, in this case, you have, two very critical ones. You know, obviously the other one is the VC or private equity guy turned into entrepreneur as well. So those are the three ones that I see often, but you have two of those. So I guess that mentality and that mindset, why do you think it makes such great entrepreneurs, like either former consultants hmm. or former investment bankers? So actually I had a third internship, which is completely different from those two experiences. Uh, I worked for the mayor's office in, in LA. This is before my investment banking summer. Uh, in the Office of Gang Reduction and Youth Development. And so that was something that was, you know, definitely a passion for me and something that really hit close to home, uh, given my upbringing. And uh, during that summer internship, we were literally putting resources to the nine most dangerous parks in all of LA that had the most gang violence and putting on programming to reduce the amount of violence. And we didn't have a, a single murder, a single shooting uh, during that period, which was something that we took a lot of pride in. Uh, and it was the first year they had ever done it. Uh, and it was the first type of, of program like that in the entire country, and they've now expanded it. Um, so definitely have had some you know, very unique and interesting sort of experiences. I think each one of them has been absolutely formative. Um, I think you know, when you go into, if you've ever seen the movie Training Day, um, there's a scene where you know, they're flying pigeons when the cops come to the, uh, to the location. Uh, I, we were working in that real location. And so I think you know, when you're in that type of environment, you know, there's not really much else that can scare you. Uh, and so that was something that was really formative for me. And, um, you know, seeing uh, that and experiencing that, then going to investment banking and seeing an entirely different side of the world, that was entirely new to me. Uh, I mean, I think that was formative in terms of how hard can you really push yourself <laughs> in terms of, are you willing to work a hundred hours a, a week? And you realize your body can actually do that for longer than you expect. Uh, consulting, I think, was very formative in terms of how to think in terms of, of frameworks and structures. Uh, so, you know, I try to take as much as I could from each of those experiences. And I like how you always, um, you know, really put in parallel your own life experiences to, to perhaps like movies that we've all, you know, had that type of relation or, or that we have <laughs> in the past. And, and one of those uh, uh, movies that kind of like a, uh, reminded you of, of, of where you were at in your life. I mean, you had kind of like, a, you know, obviously not a really midlife crisis, but you were in your mid-20s. Core life. Core life. Or, or, or Core life. I think it's 25. Uh, 20, 25. <laughs> so let's say 25. And, and all of a yeah. sudden you remind yourself of uh, the movie of Fight Club. You know, when you're like literally, I mean, t tell us about why, why Fight Club. I mean, what, it, what was reminding you of that movie? Yeah. 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 Um, so there's this like really famous scene in, in the beginning of it where Edward Norton's sitting there and he's complaining about his life and how his life has basically just become him looking at the Ikea catalog and thinking about the different things that he can buy uh, and just, you know, what else he can do for interior design to kind of um, numb the fact that he is not very happy. And there was a moment when I was watching that movie and just sitting there, it was kind of like that meets office space was a lot of my experience in, in, in consulting. And, you know, we were staying at these five star hotels the W, the Ritz and things like that, we would have $100 night, hundred dollar night uh, per diem. So eating steak, things like that, which was completely foreign to me and, and where my upbringing was. And I remember just sitting there in the office. It was during the, um, do you remember Occupy Wall Street? Yeah. Um, 
experience where you know people were protesting that these big banks had been bailed out while the rest of the population hadn't. And kind of just sitting there and realizing, just staring at that clock and just watching it tick and being like, that clock is going so slow. It feels like it's in slow motion. And just realizing that this was not the life for me. Like, I learned a ton in those two years and it still wasn't what I wanted the rest of my life to be. There had to be something else or there had to be another meaning. And don't get me wrong. I have tons of friends who are still in consulting and it's an incredible place to learn as much as possible from different industries. But that really wasn't what made me you know, hungry for life. And so I started thinking about what were those other options? What could, else could I do? Um, I thought about going into private equity, started thinking about interviewing at hedge funds. And I interviewed a bunch of these places and kept getting these final rounds uh, and um, kept getting rejected. Actually, one of our, our current investors rejected me after like probably like, you know, 12, 15 <laughs> rounds of interviews that I went with them. Uh, and I joked with them that they, now that they could have had me for a lot cheaper than what they ended up investing into the company. But uh, so as I spoke to, you know, my buddies who were in VC and I kind of shared some of the ideas that I had, they're like, oh, all the ideas are you know, pretty good. But, you know, you're 25, you've never coded, your parents aren't rich, they're not going to fund you, and you've never worked at a rocket ship startup, who's going to give you cash? So they're like, maybe you should try something else. And so, you know, I think looking at that clock, I was like, well, I probably have plenty of time to go and learn software engineering. So moved to San Francisco. This is back in 2013, just to completely, you know, start fresh. And so uh, moved into a hacker a house. Turn. I mean, yeah, yeah it, it was fine. Mean, one one hundred dollars, you know, uh, per day for steaks to to mm. going and and thirty dollars, you know, a night on a hacker house and probably switching to noodles. So, I mean, that that was probably <laughs> it was a lot of it was a lot of chipotle and yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> Good but stuff. I mean, I think you know, when you when you grow up from a humble background like that and you realize like I was happy before I had those things. I was happier before I had those things. You know, you go into the hotel the first time and you're like, wow, I remember the first time that I went into the, the W Hotel. I recorded it and I sent it to my brother. I was like, oh my God, I feel like I made it. And then after like the five, fifth time of being there, you're like, this sucks. This is not where I want to be. I want to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> so, then, so then tell us about, you know, now doing the shift, you know, going to the hacker house there in in San Francisco. And uh, mm -hmm. and I guess and I guess, you know, like even, you know, like earlier than that, what was that thought process that, that you really came up with the with the decision that I need to move and I need to go to San Francisco and I need to study or like really get into this engineering you know type of zone. Yeah, I mean, I think I was I, as I said, you know, looking at that clock, I was definitely in a period of my life where I felt like I was in a rut, right? Where I felt like I was stuck. I felt like it was. Um, you ever see that movie? I, I do talk a lot in movies. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Growing up, that's what we would do on the weekends. <laughs> was just watch tons of movies. But have you ever seen the movie Up in the Air? It's just like that's where I was living. It was just on planes, and that wasn't fulfilling either. And so right. when I told a few buddies about my startup ideas, someone's like, "Oh, you should just pay a bunch of international contractors to build the software for you, uh, and you just get started off that way." And and I was like, "I don't know anything about engineering. How am I going to know if I'm getting the right product? Like, I feel like I have to go and learn it." And so I started thinking about you know people who learned computer science in college and. You know, typically, if you think about it, it's a four-year college degree, but really maybe 50% of your classes are in computer science. So it's really a two-year endeavor. Uh, and so I was like, well, if it takes me two years to learn this skill set that I have for the rest of my life, it kind of makes sense for me just to go off and try it. And so I ended up reading this article in the New York Times about uh, ha hacker houses and people learning to code. And then someone else sent me this article like within like the next week of people learning software engineering and getting jobs at these incredible startups. And I was like, this is a sign. I got to go. And so, you know, told the firm that, you know, I wanted to go and do something else and just left. I mean, a lot of people thought like thought I was having a midlife crisis too. <laughs> they thought I was, were, all my friends were trying to convince me not to do it. You know, why would you, you know, you have this incredible job. Why would you leave it all and start over? Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, going back to my parents' story, that was real risk taking, right? Immigrating to another country, starting completely fresh, Starting a new job, starting a new career, that wasn't really risky to me. Yeah. So, so in this case, you know, you move to San Francisco, you go to the hacker house, 30 bucks a night, and then it, you ended up landing uh, a job for, for this company, for this startup that was kind of like your, your way in to the venture world. So, so how was that experience like for you? Yeah. So I got introduced to um, this guy by the name of Jiro Wade. 
Uh, he's actually now our chief growth officer at Phoenix, and he was one of the founders of Balanced. And I didn't know anything about payments. I didn't care anything about payments. It wasn't necessarily interesting to me. Um, but someone said that you know there were this really hot startup that you had to go check out, and that you know the best engineers were working there. So I met him, and we just immediately hit it off. So he's a black guy from Tucson. All his friends are Mexican. I'm Mexican. And a lot of my friends in college were all black. And we were just like, did we just meet like our best friend? And so we kind of had very similar stories and upbringings. And, um, you know, I, I just knew at that point that it didn't matter what he was doing. I wanted to work for him and I wanted to learn from him. And so there's actually, we found the email that I sent to him where I begged him for a job. And I was basically like, I will work for food. <laughs> and like, just pay me anything that you can. And I will be there. And uh, that was you know, back in 2013. And so um, it was an incredible experience. They basically gave me a laptop and they're like, go sit over there, set up your virtual machine and then start like fixing this SDK. You're going to manage all of the developer integrations. You're going to do all the support engineering. And just like, I would get the first one in, last one out. That's kind of the investment banking mentality. Yeah. And so that's what I told that team is that I'm going to be the first one in, last one out every single night. And that's what I did for two and a half years. And I just, you know, try to soak up as much as possible. And obviously there in, in Balanced as well, you were able to learn the, the transactional side too. I mean, the company went mm -hmm. through an acquisition uh, via Stripe. Mm -hmm. And actually when, yep. when, when that happened, I mean, you got two, two, access to two things. I mean, one is being able to see the full cycle, maybe like the stuff that you were seeing more on the investment banking side, but more from an operator's mindset. But then also what you mm -hmm. were really exposed to was... Uh, perhaps the vertical, you know, SaaS, you know, type of thing, you know, and that happened all when you were doing the the transitional or, or the transitional work. So tell us about this. Yep. Yeah. So just a little bit of history. Balance was basically the first payments API for marketplaces. So if you think about most payments, like, you know, a store like Nike, they're just a standalone merchant. But payments for companies like Uber, Airbnb, eBay, Amazon, it's a very different payment model that really hadn't been solved for until Balance came on the scene. And so um, at the time, we were really focused on just marketplaces. And, and, and um, what, um, when we ended up exiting, we didn't do a, do a lot of focus on the vertical SaaS space. But one of our customers at the time, and this is like I was leading all the migration of our customers over to Stripe, um, raised this massive round from a very big, well-known VC fund. And I knew that they weren't doing that much volume. And so I went into our database. Uh, and it was late at night. I was the only one in the office. And just to see how much volume and like what their growth was. And I was like, this is insane that they raised this kind of cash. And I looked at who our actual fastest growing customers were, who the biggest customer were in terms of volume. And it wasn't any of the Silicon Valley household names. It was all these vertical SaaS platforms that we as consumers don't even know are powering these types of businesses. So one, for example, was a software provider for vineyards in Napa. And if you think about it, every single vineyard in Napa has the same requirements. They need a landing page. They need to, be able to process payments. They need an e-commerce experience. They need a CRM tool. They need logistics to be able to ship the, uh, the products. They're not going to hire an army of engineers to build it out. Instead, they license this out from this vertical SaaS platform. Another company was doing that uh, for CrossFit gyms. So every single time you go to a CrossFit gym, they were providing this type of software for those gyms to run the day-to-day -day operations. Another one was doing it in travel bookings. And so this was really sort of the light bulb moment of we were going after that uh, wrong market. Now, the, like the sort of rise of vertical SaaS Every VC talks about it, they're looking into it and they see this massive potential. But that was sort of the, the first really proof point that these vertical SaaS companies were differentiating based on payments and other financial services. Got it. So then so then obviously here you have like that kind of like breakthrough moment uh, and you realize mm -hmm. as well that perhaps it's time for you to really go at it on your own and, and build your own baby. So, I mean, how, how yeah. was that process like of, of, of you, you know, really incubating this and bringing it to life? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of it's just kind of inertia um, and it's just these little milestones. It's these little baby steps that kind of start to snowball into something. Um, when the TechCrunch article went out that we had exited uh, to Stripe, a bunch of these vertical SaaS companies started reaching out to us, saying to all the engineers and saying, hey, we really love what you built back at your last company. What if you came in house and did that for us? And so we weren't looking to you know go in house. But again, oh, someone's willing to pay us for these services. What if we start? you know, looking at this like new innovative approach to payments where we're not the payment company, we're helping them stand up their own payment businesses. We're helping them turn this historical cost center into a profit center. And so 
during that process, I, I think, you know, how do you turn this into something real? The way that I kind of share it, it's kind of like thinking of, of creating a song or painting a picture. It's never going to be perfect on your first try, right? But you got to put that first brush stroke. You got to make that first note. You got to write that first line of code. You got to start pitching, creating your docs, creating your decks, and just trying, right? Asking people, talking to customers, trying, you know, in the same way that my mom was getting all those notes till she got to that first yes, that was us for our first customer. Right. We probably got rejected from every single like nobody would talk to us. I would go. I went to Money uh, 2020 for the first time and, uh, you know, was just walking around to random people just trying to see if they would listen to my pitch. Uh, and eventually that's kind of <laughs> how you build your network. I mean, I was I was a, 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 an engineer at a payment startup. It wasn't like I built this massive payment network. Right. Like I didn't know those industry insiders. So how could I break in? It's just going and, and trying and, you know, not being afraid of, of people shutting you down. So what, what ended up being the business model of Phoenix Payments? Yeah, so uh, we have a very innovative approach in that we license out our software to these vertical SaaS companies uh, at a sort of fixed price, right? So it's kind of a very classic enterprise SaaS model as opposed to the traditional approach that um, you know other payment providers do. So most payment providers have, like, they'll charge you a number of basis points, 2.9%. Plus three cents per transaction. Once you really start to hit scale, that becomes prohibitively expensive, and they start looking for other options. So rather than these companies outgrowing these type of develop, developer-friendly payment APIs and then having to build their own army of engineers, which is what Lyft did, they can now come to Phoenix, and we can provide them all the payment APIs uh, and infrastructure to stand up their payment business. It's a far more scalable business model. Got it. And how much capital have you guys raised to date? Uh, we've raised about 102 million dollars. And I yeah. know that the seed round was quite a quite a challenging, you know, moment. I, I think that you guys pitched like over seventy people. So I mean, how? how was <laughs> it that? took us how, six how months. Was that? Six months. It took us six months. Six months. Pitched over seventy people until I got my first term sheet. Uh, I mean, it, it was tough, right? Uh, um, it was again just kind of that persistence and that grit to get through it. I think in the beginning, or if I go back to that time, this was two thousand seventeen. Um, this was like during the craze of crypto and Bitcoin and Bitcoin, I think, was trading at $20,000 a coin. And everybody thought that the crypto world was going to destroy the legacy financial systems. They were going to destroy the need for payments and Visa and MasterCard. Every single VC just said, isn't isn't Bitcoin just going to make this useless? And I was like, no, this, that's not the way the payment systems work. But going against that kind of trend was incredibly difficult. And finally, we got our first term sheet. Uh, and uh, it's kind of all history from there. I mean, the I mean, that you've been able hey, to... Exactly, that's, that's a false statement. That's when the hard work begins, right? Once you get the... Yeah, you can go off and pitch and pitch and pitch, but pitching and, and raising money isn't really the achievement, right? It's actually going off and right. building that, that company and building that vision of, of what you're taking to the market. Well, absolutely. I guess that financing is not a, it's not a milestone, it's a stepping stone. I mean, in your case, you got yep. great investors. I mean, you got Sequoia, you got Lightspeed, you got Bain. I mean, talking about someone that came from a completely different sector, you know, that goes into building his own company and lands the absolute best. I mean, how do you think about networks? Because you've come from nothing. Your family has come from nothing. I mean, you guys built everything yourselves. And here you are, you know, like you land the absolute best in the industry coming out of left field. I mean, how do you manage to really do this? And, and more importantly, how do you think about networks and building those around you? Yeah. Um, I mean, when you first start off your company, everybody tells you to go and do a friends and family round. Uh, that's kind of tough if your friends and family don't necessarily have a massive net worth, right? And so uh, that was something that was kind of off the table to begin with. Um, I think, you know, breaking into that network and breaking into that industry is difficult. Um, I think, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say it was easier based on the college that I went into and, and having those sorts of connections that I had built throughout that period in, in time. Um, but there was uh, one of my college professors, his name is like Rob, uh, Robert Putnam, has this course um, that he in a book that he wrote called Bowling Alone. And basically what he said was that if you actually look at people's net worth and, and, and the best and strongest indicator or correlation of someone being successful is actually the size of the Rolodex. And nowadays people don't really have Rolodexes, but the concept still remains, right? Building networks takes time. And I think doing it from a place where you genuinely are interested in people and you're not just transactional, that's really how you build a powerful network. I've never you know, gone around and just said, hey, you know, what can you do for me? It's just, these are fascinating, interesting people. And I want to have conversations. I want to get to know them. Um, and I think when it comes from that place of just sincerity and authenticity, 
that's really when people want to help you. Um, and so that was something that I've always kind of taken that approach. I mean, I think I picked this up from my mom. She is, you know, a people's person, you know, she has the gift of gab and she loves to, you know, make people feel good and she likes to bring people together. And I think I've, I've, I've always had that approach. And so, um, you know, when we went out to our fundraising round, um, I had, I basically dumped my LinkedIn from the folks that I knew and just reached out to people and said, Hey, I'm starting my own company. Do you know people who in the industry, you know, who could help? And, you know, one thing leads to another, and that's how you end up getting your first check. Uh, there was a candidate who I worked for. Uh, I worked on a mayoral candidate, and uh, I reached out to him for for help. And he introduced me to the the VC who gave us our first term sheet. Um, and so, you know, it's just these kind of per chance interactions that can have really profound impacts on your life. Absolutely. So, so in 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 this case, for example, with Phoenix, I mean, anything that you can tell us about where you guys are at today, I mean, the amount of employees or the size of the of the business, anything? Yeah, I mean, it's exciting to know that we, you know, we're processing billions and billions of dollars all around the world. Uh, it's exciting to share that, you know, we were 15 people as of 2019. We're now, uh, uh, I think we just crossed 100 people uh, last week, uh, planning to double headcount over the next year. So um, a lot of growth and a lot of hard work. So if anybody's listening and is interested, we're always hiring. And obviously, you have a bunch of books behind you. So, you know, probably the people that are listening to the podcast. Not a not Zoom room. They're not, not a Zoom <laughs> background. <laughs> they're, they're not able to see it, the people that are that are listening, but at least the people that are watching. So I guess, you know, as a founder, you know, and you were just talking about like that incredible growth from 15 to over 100. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sure that, yet that for you, really getting access to the right knowledge and, you know, the right tools has been critical. So I guess, which three books would you say have, have had the biggest impact for you as an entrepreneur? Hmm. I mean, I try to read as much as possible. Um, and I wish I would have read it earlier back in my you know early days of starting the company. I think in the, the first like year or two, I was just reading the 900 page PDFs of all of the payment processors to understand how they all connected together. So I was still reading. It was just something very, un, very more the, the technical aspects than the sort of leadership. And I think there's so many incredible nuggets. So I actually ask uh, the executives when I interview them, hey, what's your favorite book? Uh, you know, what book really helped shape you? Uh, and I'll pick them up and, and, and read them. Um, so that's kind of how I started accumulating these. Uh, my favorite uh, or three favorite books are the ones that really shaped me. Um, at least over the last like year and a half or two years. Uh, number one is uh, The Score Takes Care of Itself by Bill Walsh. Uh, if anybody at the company is listening to this podcast, they're going to laugh because I quote that book all the time. <laughs> but it's basically, <laughs> it's about the former 49ers coach and how he turned their uh, team from the worst record in the league uh, to being Super Bowl champions in 18 months. And really how formative culture is in building um, um, excellence and building towards excellence. And so that was something impactful. The Checklist Manifesto, uh, if you ever read that, is an incredible book in terms of how to think about problem solving. Um, uh, Playing to Win is also a, a great war, uh, book on thinking through sort of uh, strategic decision making. Um, um, Extreme Accountability or Extreme Ownership is this book about uh, Marines uh, and how they think through leadership. So I could go on and on. Oh, my favorite book actually recently is uh, is The Dip. And so it's this like 80 to 100 page book that um, someone shared with me recently about, you know, how the greatest gains in, in, in excellence and growth in, in any company come through the sort of ruts as a company. And like, that's where, you know, you define yourself and that's where true growth comes from. So it's a short read and I'd suggest everybody reads it. Is that Seth Godin? Yes. I, I don't know. I th I th okay, got it, got it. That's a good one. That's a good one. Very good yeah. books. So I guess uh, if, if you had the opportunity to go to sleep tonight, Richie, and you seem a quite an active, <laughs> a qu quite active individual. So let's say you go to sleep tonight and you wake up in a world five years later. I mean, tremendous news. You've been able to recover for all the loss of sleep, you know, like of, of, of building and scaling a company. And you wake up in a world... <laughs> You wake up in a world where the vision of Phoenix payments is fully realized. What does that world look like? I mean, we have become the operating system for fintech worldwide. You know, we're processing a significant chunk of the world's economy in our systems. And, and that's really the part that's so exciting uh, about being in payments is that it's one of those products that everybody touches uh, multiple times per day, but really no one has a sort of deep appreciation for the complexity that goes on be behind the scenes. And that's really what we want to be able to create um, is a world where you can launch any type of payment or financial services product faster, cheaper than ever. And if we can provide a world where that exists, 
the true beneficiaries are the consumers. It's the merchants. It's the people who are getting the best commerce experiences possible. That's amazing. So, so one of the questions that I typically ask the guests that come on the show is, if you had the opportunity to go into a time machine and you go back in time and you have a chat with that younger, that younger self, maybe that, that, that Richie that, that is coming out of balance and thinking about you know, doing your own thing, if you could have that ear of that younger Richie and give yourself one piece of advice before launching a company, what would that be and why, given what you know now? Oh, there's so many pieces. Uh, let's see. I think I'll say two pieces. Uh, one is learning to ignore the noise and really focus. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of people talk about focus on thinking of all the things that you will do, but focus really comes down to the things that you won't do and really being disciplined about that as well. And it's so important when you're really getting started uh, as a company. Uh, the second piece that I would say is really invest in your own leadership training. I mean, you know, very few people are taught how to be great leaders. Very few people are taught how to be great managers. Uh, and so investing in yourself, especially as a founder, as early as possible um, is incredibly important. I was lucky enough that I was able to get an executive coach once we could afford one. And it's been transformational uh, for me, um, getting to know other founders as well, to learn from their lessons of leadership and how they can communicate with their teams and, and lead them. Um, those are things that you know, are absolutely part of the job and part of the role. Absolutely. And now imagine that we are able to go even earlier in time. You know, we go back yeah. to even before you got accepted into Harvard and and perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, like you were a, in Orange County, you know, uh, obviously, you know, as you were saying, you know, like uh, not having access to like a lot of of the stuff that maybe you have access to now. Right. Um, yeah. uh, what, what would what would you tell your younger self? Hmm. Trust your gut. <laughs> trust your gut it's never led me astray yeah i love it well richie for the folks that are listening what is the best way for them to reach out and say hi tiktok i'm totally kidding now linkedin <laughs> is definitely i was like wow <laughs> i want to see those dance moves i want to see those dance moves <laughs> i do not have a tiktok uh yeah linkedin is the best way <laughs> amazing well richie thank you so much for being on the deal maker show today thank you for having me